Camera gear, some clothes, boots, gloves, batteries. All right, guys, I'm just packing up for the Arctic, heading out to Norway, and we got a lot of stuff. Yeah, we're gonna grab our bags and walk to the bus, jump on the plane, and then another plane, and then another plane, and then we'll be in Norway. the very northern region. This is Alta Airport, which is about as far north as you can go. And my buddy Casper is gonna be picking us up from the bus station. We got about a four hour bus ride to go. Yeah, super excited to see him. Haven't been with him. I, uh, I last worked with him up in the Arctic a few months ago. We, uh, we work on the National Geographic ships together. So super cool dude. He runs a, an expedition business up here in Norway doing skiing and snowshoeing and all kinds of cool stuff. So we're gonna go exploring with him for a few days. Lee, it's gonna be an amazing trip. Out here. There you go. What is this? It's a Ooh. spaghetti thing. This is like you went all out. So we're feeding the chickens our scraps. Pasta. Pasta. Yeah, I love that pasta. Just came from the neighbor's farm. Picked up some eggs. Pretty much everything we're gonna do is new to me. I've never been dog sledding. I've never been Nordic skiing. I've done some cross country, but not a lot. Both Laura and I are super, super pumped. My name is Kasper Yeer, 33. <laughs> I am originally Danish, but I've lived in Norway since uh, 2008. We're in, um, in Karasok, in the heartland of Sami culture. Um, Sami being reindeer herders, like, very simple. Um, Karasok is the Sami capital of the Norwegian Sami. Freeze because they, uh, when they evaporate, then they they freeze. This is definitely considered the Arctic. Karasjok is located on at 70 north, two minutes or so, um, and the Arctic Circle is 66 66 north. So we are about 400 or yeah, 450 500 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Well, we um, we do a lot of like uh, I would say regular regular Norwegian outdoorsy stuff. Um, um, skis and snowshoes would be the two most common. Skis being the most common, but some places snowshoes is better. Um, we have a, a lot of a lot of puppies to uh, a lot of dogs and so on to train. So hopefully some dog sledding as well if we find the time and it all works out. And, um, yeah. Dog sledding is is not a part of of like Norwegian culture uh, like skiing is. Dog sledding is 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 something new to Norwegian culture and has been like a sport thing for about 40 years and that sport comes from Alaska uh, where dog sledding has been a much greater part of culture for much longer uh, than it has here. Here in Karasjok, we have one of the oldest dog sledding communities in, in the country. The, 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 the leader of that community would be Sven, Sven Inghorn. He, he wouldn't like me to say that really, but, but he, because he's the one that has been doing it the longest. He is one of the sports really grand old men. Um, and he's a, he's a pure legend in, in, in Scandinavian dog sledding. 
and he came to Katashok in the early 80s and, and began doing his dog sledding career from here or his competition career from here where he ended up uh, helping to start Finnmarksløb which is the Scandinavian equivalent of the Adithrot he competed, if I remember correctly, 13 times in a row, 13 years in a row on Finnmarksløb, where he won 11 of those 13 and became number two on the other two. As far as I remember, his worst placement in Finnmarksløb is a second place. Um, after that, he ended up going to being the first ever European to compete in Aditarot with his own dogs. Sven is is a very impressive character, not just because of his sportly achievements, but really because of everything. He came to Karashok with, with nothing and has basically, he's with the help of, of, of a few very, very close employees and so on, then over the years, then he has built one of the most unique tourist companies in, not just in Norway, but in Scandinavia, maybe even in Europe. Huskies that we use for dog sledding here in, in Norway and in Scandinavia is uh, predominantly Alaskan Huskies. So it's the same sort of Huskies that you, you, you use for, for the same purpose in, in Alaska. And Alaskan Husky is not a pure blood breed, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a fixed breed you can say. It's, it's a hybrid dog between many different, many different species of dogs that are there are all sorts, there are even pointers and setters and border collies and German shepherds and all sorts have been mixed together um, over a few decades. They can, look, they can look quite similar in one litter, but that also means that from litter to litter and from dog yard to dog yard, they can be very, very, very different looking. We don't really look for any, any coloration, for example. We're looking for different things when breeding these dogs and looking at how their coat is, how they can cope with the cold, how willing they are to work and all these things and how easy they are to handle because a lot of people have a misconception that work dogs or sled dogs are very, um, can be like aggressive or this sort and if, if, if you ever if you ever come and visit a an Alaskan Husky kennel you would see that that, that is not the case at all. The Alaskan Huskies are deeply, not dependent, but deeply um, they, they, they love people, they love to be around people, and they, they love people. Yeah, I started here in September, but I've been mushing since I was little. I uh, know, I'm from south of Norway, uh, a place called Aski. So I started mushing there when I was uh, eight years old. So I went to like a high school with mushing. Yeah, so I moved to Finnmark when I was 16 to do this. It's very incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, my name is uh, Mia and I'm here as a handler, working as a guide for the winter season. Yeah, now I'm tying up the sled so the dogs don't take off without us. This is the soft brake and this is the hard brake. So this brake we usually use for stopping, then we just go on the bolt, like this. And this one is more for like, yeah, soft brake. This one, yeah, that's the anchor. This one you're stopping or need to stop, you can put that one down. Oh, you tell them commands. So yes. we use G and Pa. The sled is going wherever the dogs are going, so you can do a little bit with your body weight, but not really like super much. It's quite amazing we're standing here and steering the dogs. But it's actually very relaxing when you get out there and you're just, it's only you and the dogs. Dog sledding is, is in a is in a big like change culturally really because it, it it's becoming a thing that more and more people know about and more and more people follow like a sport. It's it's such a unique sport that many people find it very attractive to follow. More sponsors are coming in and more and more people want to to try this themselves. That means more and more little kennels are springing up and and the whole community is becoming bigger and bigger. And it's a it's a very tight community where 
a lot of young people is coming in now. And I think one of the reasons why people find it like an attractive sport to follow is that there is no there is no separation between gender. Because there is no males and females that are being men and women compete exactly on the same terms. And what shows is that it used to be like the winner of of Finnmarksløpet or or the big races would be like a tough uh, bearded adult man. That would be the winner. But but um, both in, in Alaska and here in, in Norway, it, it shows that that over the last decade or so, the, the women has really has really been beating the guys, the, the men's ass, really, uh, with um, women doing the doing the fastest ever run, uh, women, uh, three women on, on three high, on top on top three. Uh, you know, it, it's it's been it, it's it, it's a really cool development, and to see that that there is no. You know, the dogs are the ones doing the, the real job. The, it's about keeping the dogs running and, and very often girls are, are better at that. Or, or, yeah. We're super bundled up. We're heading out to visit one of the reindeer herds. They'll pick you guys up in like have these sleds behind the scooters that you'll be put in, uh, wearing tons of clothing because it's gonna be cold. Um, sitting on reindeer skins properly with reindeer skins over your knees and just to try and keep warm. And we have a very close relationship with with uh, some of the Sami reindeer herders, so they allow us to um, to join them and or to our guests in very small groups. Not a tourist product at all, really, because they're going to the mountain every day, every day themselves, to go and check up on the deer and make sure that the deer stays in this in the in the area that the herders want them to stay in, and so on. And, and then they will drive you to wherever they have their animals at the time, uh, and that changes, maybe not so much day to day, but at least week to week. They will show you how to how they how they keep the herd together because they spread out as soon as they get the chance. And, and they usually feed them uh, to try and make sure that the, that the reindeer know that it's a good thing to come close to people because that makes them a lot easier to deal with and you can get get a very close experience with the deer and, and they they usually make a make a fire where you can you can have have lunch around the fire and, It's a, it's 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 a, it's quite a, it's quite a, a neat uh, experience, really. It means that the sun never touches the horizon, but there is like a blue light. It's very tricky to twilightish light without having any color on the horizon. So it's just kind of blue everywhere. Wow! Unbelievable evening. All right, packing it up, and then you navigate by map and compass, just like you would if you were skiing. We do, um, we do mainly ski expeditions. Long, we call, I, I'm, I, have a, I have a hard time about the word expeditions because nowadays everything is an expedition, but um, our shortest trip is nine days, which uh, is on skis and in tents and everything. So, um, so we do yeah, ski expeditions in, in the lack of a better term, long ski trips. Uh, where we are 100% self-sufficient, uh, bringing everything with us. All of our ski expeditions you usually have to book the year before, both because you need to be in a certain fitness 
um, but also because we only do very small groups. Uh, usually, uh, a regular group is usually more like four, five, or six people uh, to one or two guides. Um, snowshoe hikes uh, with hunting for northern lights, of course, in the dark period, and ice fishing on some of the lakes in the mountains. And unbelievable experiences out here. There will Follow me.